I come to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Epiphany! Happy Epiphany! All right, all right. This is a big day for the church. A real big day. Uh, technically, the Feast of Epiphany is on Monday in our church calendar, but the Feast of Epiphany is one of the few feast days that's called a movable feast. It means it's so important to our Christian formation, to us following Jesus Christ, that if it falls on a different day besides Sunday, we can pick it up and move it and say, no, we're putting it on a Sunday. There's not many that we can do that with, but this, the Feast of the Epiphany is one of them. Now, why? 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 Why is it so important? Are there other ones you don't do that with? But this one, why? Well, we just got done with Christmas not too long ago. And we spent uh, about four weeks getting ourselves prepared for Christmas. Getting us prepared, this walk to the manger. We go through Advent to prepare our hearts, to prepare our souls, so we can be, have the rebirth of Jesus Christ within us. And then we get there, and you get one day. And then Christmas is over. Right? Well, technically not, right? We got Christmas tied. We got the season of Christmas. The church says, no, 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 you're not done. Keep on celebrating. So how many days of Christmas do we get? 12 days of Christmas. Except, the church says, we go, Christmas tide goes all the way to the baptism of our Lord. That's when we celebrate Christmas and we go all the way to, the, to, to this epiphanic moment of the baptism of our Lord, which happens usually two weeks after Christmas. So sometimes you don't just get 12 days. Sometimes, like this season, you get more than 12 days. So we got a whole Christmas keeps on going. This Christmas season goes all the way till next Sunday, which is the baptism of our Lord. So we got to keep on moving on and grooving on what Christmas means to us because the church, the church of Jesus Christ says, I do not want you to just go, oh, that was a cute little holiday. We had an event wreath. We took it down, had some presents, and then I get back to my normal life. Oh, no. Christmas changes us, transforms us, renews us, redeems us. And Epiphany is a time where we have this revelation. What is an Epiphany? It's a revelation. It's like, oh, I, I had an Epiphanic moment. There, it was, there, I had an Epiphany. And so now we say Epiphany is a time to say, what do you want to do with this revelation inside of your heart? All that work you did during Advent, all that formation that happened to you, all that celebration you had on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Now, how is that going to move you through 2020 so you, your life is transformed, so other lives are transformed, so we continue to reveal the love of Jesus Christ within this world, in a world that desperately needs the love of Jesus Christ. And God is always rattling us and using us, the most unorthodox characters, to teach us how to worship our Lord. He's always using these unorthodox ways to show us, oh, this is how you do it. This is how you walk the walk and talk the talk. Remember the parable that Jesus used? Very, one of his most famous parables that still refer to today. That Jesus says, this is how you walk the walk and talk the talk. The parable of the good Samaritan. Samaritan. A Samaritan? They're dirty. They're not like us. They weren't part of the tribe. They had a temple somewhere else. They lost in a war with the, with, uh, the Israelites. They uh, only worshiped the first five books of the Bible, just the Torah. Uh-uh-uh, no way. Samaritan's bad. But Jesus, preaching to a Jewish audience, says, you want to walk like me, talk like me, and act like we, me, and follow the way of God? I want you to be like the Samaritan. And that has stuck in our hearts so much that 2,000 years later, it's about being a good Samaritan. But oddly enough, that doesn't mean being a good Jew. I was something very opposed to the culture then. Rattled people. Wait, what? What are you talking about, Jesus? But yet we have now the Samaritan's Purse. We have all these nonprofits named after the Samaritan. Scripture is always challenging us. So we don't just look within our own silos of how we follow and we reveal Jesus Christ. So we don't just stay in our denominational silos and our religious silos and our, and our any kind of tribal silos, communal silos. God is saying, look, look, look outside. Challenge yourself. And today is another day that happens in the Epiphany. Today, God's going to show us how do we respond to Christmas? How do we reveal the Christ within us? How do we worship and adore this Christ child? And he says, act like these three pagans. He uses three pagans to teach us how we can worship and adore our Lord. 
So if you're wondering, how do, how, how do, how, what, what do I do now? What do I do with Christmas? What, what do I do with it? I don't want to go back to normal life. I want to keep on celebrating the joy of Christmas. Well, the three magi are here to teach us. Not Jews. Not part of the way. But somehow, God was talking to them, and they were... They were aware and hungry to follow this star that led them out of the east, to lead them out of Arabia to a new place, to walk and give their time and heart to follow and bring these beautiful gifts to this Christ child to show up and to adore and to prostrate themselves before the king of the Jews. So imagine that. You got three magi. Probably uh, scholars would say they're probably from Persia, the Persian Empire showing up in probably some good garb if they're representing uh, the, the, the emperor of, of, of Persia. They got these beautiful gifts and they show up in Jerusalem. They show up in Jerusalem. That, that, that's going to, whoa, 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 stop the press. What's going on here? King Herod is like, come on in. Let me talk to you. What are you guys here for? Hey, we're here to honor and to show homage to the new king of the Jews. Who? Who? The new king of the Jews. We followed the North Star. We got here. Yes, there's a new king. Congratulations. We're so happy for you. Well, I, I'm the king of the Jews. Right, right. But there's a new king. And then we followed the star. We're here. We want to show, we want to show respect. We're showing this. You think, you think King Herod liked to play well in the sandbox? He, 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 he was not the one who was like a team player. He killed his own cousin sometimes if they're getting too much power. He's like, oh, really? Why don't you tell me more about this king of the Jews? And they're like, yeah, he was born here. And then, King, and then King Herod says, okay, so everyone's been waiting for this Messiah, right? Everyone's waiting for the Messiah. All the Jews are waiting for this Messiah to show up. So he gathers all, Scripture tells us, he gathers all the smart people, the scribes who knew the law. A lot of these scribes were Pharisees and Sadducees. They knew Scripture. Pharisees knew Scripture so well. What are these three magi talking about? Well... In Micah, the prophet Micah, as you heard today in Scripture, and you can go read it in Micah too, yeah, from Bethlehem is going to come the Messiah. And, and, and so from this town, if they're showing up here and following the star, it, 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 this could be the time. Well, that's amazing news. This is what prophets have been talking about forever. This is what everyone's been waiting for. The Messiah is here. We're good. We're going to be freed from oppression. The Jews are ready to roll. We can, we can, we can exit out of this Roman oppression. Let's go. And Herod is the king of the Jews. He's part Jewish. Did he say, Magi, show me the way. We're here. Salvation is here. Is that what happened? No, Scripture says he was disturbed. And he wasn't only disturbed, but so was everyone. In Israel, Israel, they were disturbed. Why were they disturbed? Herod had so much fear that the Messiah was here. What is he fearful of? He's fearful he's going he's to lose his power. Oh, but we just can't sit here and just blame Herod and say, oh, yeah, what a bad dude. We all get fearful. We all get fearful what it's going to be like to completely give homage and adore Jesus Christ. What will happen if I give my life completely over to Jesus in 2020? I mean, I like my life. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 got, I got God. I'm good with Jesus. But if I give myself completely over to Jesus, am I going to be like those weirdo Christians down the street? I mean, those people are weirdo. I mean, the people are really into Christian. I don't know. Do I have to change my behavior? Do I have to start doing things a little bit differently? Do I have to give up some things that are probably too excessive? But that's my thing. I like doing that. So maybe, no, 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 no. I'm going to stay right here with King Herod. Nope. I mean, I mean we, we all do it. We all do it. So do, I don't know if I give myself over. That means I have to change my way, the change I, I use my time, my money, my everything. Because if I go full Christian, ooh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready for that. That's the fear. That's the fear that's right now. Oh, the Messiah is here. It's a reckoning. Are we ready for that? And then you got the scribes and you got the Pharisees and, and, and they, they, they reading the scripture. They are literally reading the prophet saying, yep, it's probably happening in Bethlehem right now. Do they run over to see it for themselves? Nope. There's a stirb too. If you're a religious leader of the day, if you're part of the tribe, you're sitting there and you're like, hey, we got Herod. Life is good right now. The king is with us. The leader of our whole nation right here, he's with us. He's part Jewish. We're good. Why would I want to rattle that up? What is this Messiah going to do? So they stay there with the earthly power. And they don't go to prostrate themselves with these three pagans to the heavenly power. 
And that, my brothers and sisters, is a juggle we have every day. Juggling the powers of us here on earth with the powers of heaven. And do we trust the powers of heaven to guide us and protect us and to fulfill us and to feed us over the powers that earth provides for us? The powers of materialism. So these three pagans, who are probably Zoroastrians, <laughs> who are probably astrologers, come and then they leave Herod's palace and the star was gone, right? And so now they're probably in fear because they can sense the fear of Herod. But then the star reappears. The light of Christ shows them and then it goes right over this place in Bethlehem and it shows them right to this home and now we know that Jesus is in a house, no longer in a manger. Joseph saved up his travelocity points and was able to upgrade now to a house. They no longer say he's in a manger. So now we're in a house and it must be a little bit time later because they're not calling him baby Jesus anymore in scripture. Now they're calling him a child. You heard that in scripture twice. They said, and the child, no longer a baby. That word, the Greek word used is like, so this, he's getting a little bit older here. We don't know how much older, but a little bit older. And they show up, and it says, what did it say when they got to the home, when they saw the star? They followed that light, and they followed right over the house. What does scripture say? It says, they were overjoyed. Look at the difference of how to respond to the Messiah. The religious leaders, the elite of the day, the folks, were with fear, worry, concern. And Herod would respond with death and murder. But the pagans respond with joy. That is how our calling to Christmas, how our calling to being called to the Christ child should give us so much joy because life is changing. This gift that God gives us, this life that he gives us, these treasures that he gives us, this time that he gives us, it's all so good. And we can see life through fearful eyes. Oh, sure, yeah, we can. Through anxious eyes, through selfish eyes, through arrogant eyes. But the light of Christ is calling us to look through eyes of joy, which is not happiness. It's different than happiness. Joy can even be there during the darkest times, like these magi were right there in the darkness, but having the light of Christ guiding them. And they get into this home, and they see the child, and what is the first thing they do? They bow down, and they worship this child, this king. And do they bring, you know, just some random gifts from the gift shop over in uh, Persia as they're out the door where they're just like, oh, hey, you, I got to go over to, um, we got to go over and see this king of kings, you know, over in like, um, over where, where the Jews are. Um, can you stop by Walgreens and just pick up like, I don't know, we don't have much money, like a bottle of wine under fourteen ninety nine, but don't let it look cheap though. I mean, get like a bottle of wine that no one recognizes so they won't know. Like don't, don't get a nine ninety nine. That looks real cheap. But go fourteen ninety to nineteen ninety nine. But don't go over twenty bucks. It's not really worth it. Is, I mean, is, is that what they did to come with their gifts? No. Oh, they brought the best. They brought the best that their land had to offer from the Far East. What was the Far East then known for? Oh, the senses. Yes, things that smell good. The spices. Oh, we don't have that. Yeah, they brought. They brought what Persia had to offer. They brought the frankincense. That's the stuff you would use during worship. You use it in the temple. It became this huge thing in the temple to, for, for worship. Worth a ton of money. It was only good for the temple. They, they, who, who could afford it? They brought that. And that makes sense with Jesus Christ because he is the high priest. And then they brought myrrh. Myrrh that you would use to embalm the dead. Very expensive too. And of course that works for Jesus for his life that he's going to give to die for us. And then finally they give gold. The gold of the Far East. Because of the royal power of who Jesus is. The gold of who he is. And so they offer it to him, not knowing that these gifts, they just do it uh, to be customary, to give over, to adore this king. But these gifts are probably what allowed Joseph and his family to get the heck out of Dodge and go to Egypt. Because remember, they're broke. And so when Herod comes to call and, and Joseph gets that call, of like, Joseph, you got to get your family out of here. How's Joseph going to get to Egypt? Scholars probably think like, well, now he's got frankincense and myrrh. He can sell that and boom, they're on their way. So these magi save the Holy Family's life because we know the massacre of the innocents is just right around the corner from Herod's fear. These magi don't know, quote unquote, Jesus. Don't, quote unquote, know the law. But what they do know is they follow the light 
The light leads them. They obey the light. They come to the Christ child and they don't think about it. They just bow down and they don't offer a cheap bottle of wine. They offer their best. They offer what's the best thing they can offer. They offer their time. They offer their heart and they offer gold and they offer the the physical things they can say to say, hey, we adore you. We pay homage to you. We must bring our best to God. We must offer our best to God. We cannot offer just the side dish of our lives to God. We can't compartmentalize. I mean, we can, but but if you compartmentalize, just put God in a little box and say, this is what I got for God because right over here, this is for my sports. Right over here, this is for my family. Right over here, this is for my job. This is for my retirement. This is for uh, uh, my good times, my video games, my social media, my this. And and God's just mixed in there somewhere. You're going to get a God that big. But when you make God everything, and you make all of that to be about God, or you cut out the things that don't really need that much space in your time and in your life, they don't really need, are not worthy of your resources, of your time, of your treasures, of your talents, and you say, no, I give that over to you, God. Well, God says, well, here we go. Let's bring you the joy of the heavens, and let's change this world and change your heart. These three pagans teach us about what it is to offer ourselves and offer the best of ourselves. It's not coincidental right now that we're in the season of stewardship. And stewardship shouldn't be a season where we get the fear. <laughs> oh God, here we go. We're talking about money. Oh gosh, here we go. We're gonna keep the lights on. I get it, I get it, I get it. Just please get through this, please. Oh no. No, no, this is this is this is Christ's resources. We're talking about the gifts of Jesus Christ. We're talking about time, treasures, and talents that have been given to us by a God, and it's all his. And so now we're saying, how do we use this God? How do we change this church? How do we change Martin County? How do you want this church move forward? So how am I a part of that? Because each one of us is a part of it through our time, through our treasure, through our talents, and today we're going to focus on time. Next week, we'll focus on treasure. Then we'll focus on talents. But how are we using this, this precious commodity of time in our lives to honor God? You get 86,400 seconds every single day. What a precious commodity. They don't roll over to the next day. They don't get taken away from you. Other things can. Relationships come and go. Money. (laughs) You could have a million dollars today, it could be all gone tomorrow. Our health, cars, homes, could disappear or they can come right back at you. But your time, that is a precious gift. And how do you want that time filled? Do you want to use that time to, full of anxiety and just to-do lists, full of your own kind of self and what myself needs, full of criticizing others or thinking about others or just worrying about others, comparing yourself to others? Or do you want to use this precious gift of time that God gives you to honor him, to use redemptive time? Time that you just give over to Jesus and say, God, how do I use that time for my heart to be transformed and for this world to be transformed? Help me be a part of your kingdom, God, in 2020. We have a beloved parishioner here, Elaine DeClaw, and she's so wonderful. And I talked to her about this, and um, her video is up online so you can see the story. Um, she, she came into our church about five years ago, and she said, you know, I came in, Father Christian. I was just, I was just so angry. <laughs> I was an angry person. And I got here and I allowed the liturgy to flow over me. And there was a, her star showed up. Her star was the caring ministry. Somehow she got the bug and someone said, hey, why don't you come and join the caring ministry? She's like, what's the caring ministry? Oh, well, it's a, it's a ministry where you go and, and, and you visit folks over at the hospitals and over at the rehab centers. Well, what do I got to do? Just show up. Just give them your time. Oh, you want some resources? We got got this little blue sheet. It's called the Good News Daily. Just bring that with you. There, you can read some scripture, read the reflection, ask if they want prayers. But most importantly, you just be the presence of Christ. Me? Yeah, yeah, you just just be the presence of Christ. Just be present. You don't have to do much. Okay. And she shows up. And it's a little rough at first, but she keeps on showing up. 
She keeps on showing up, and it's risky. This is scary stuff for her, but she kept on doing it because we know when it gets a little dangerous, it gets a little risky, that means God's up to something. We, God is not a comfortable God. He pushes us into uncomfortable situations, so we need to rely upon him. And she learns to trust God more, and she learns to be present in these rooms, and she starts hearing stories of people, people in the real rough spots, tough spots, and she gets to be present with them, and she realizes she's actually pretty good at this, and she gets this love inside of her, and it starts growing inside of her, and she gets this joy when she wakes up because she gets to know she gets to go to these hospitals, go to these rehab centers. She's got people who know her by name who are waiting for her expectantly. Please show up tomorrow. Please pray with me tomorrow. And she is part of God's kingdom and she's got joy. And she's realizing that her anger is being transformed, that God has taken this energy, this time that she spent on anger and has converted it and transformed it into the joy and life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ. And she says, wow, yeah, lives are being touched. People's lives are being touched. And it's amazing. I'm a part of this. But God, Christian, God has been changing my heart. I'm a different woman than when I walked into this church and than who I am today. That's the kingdom of God. God can take something that we think could be so dreary, so hopeless, or whatever, and says, well, let me take that. If you give me your time, if you give me the space, I'll transform it and make it so beautiful. It might not be comfortable. It might not be easy. It's not going to be a bed of roses, but boy, it's going to be glorious if you just bow down and pay homage and give me your time, your heart, your resources, because I gave them to you. <laughs> That's all mine. So let me use it for this kingdom we're building. We're all called to build this incredible kingdom that's been revealed through this baby, this child. <laughs> And part of it is we just got to show up. But the other part of it is seeing, when am I just giving God the appetizer or the side dishes in my life? And where can I give God my best to look at the gifts that God has given me and say, help me use that for your kingdom? How do I offer my time and look at the time that I use during the day and say, wow, I don't really need to spend so much time doing this, doing that, doing that. It's taking way too much space. I'm going to give that to the Lord. And all the time when I'm just in, throughout my day, when I'm in my relationships, when I'm at work, when I'm with folks, am I using that as redemptive time to be a representative of God's kingdom of love or is it is hate? Am I being representative of darkness or being a representative of light? Am I being a representative of despair or am I being a representative of hope? Because God, I want you, to, your hope to be alive inside me. Christ, be born within me. We're all stewards of God's kingdom. It is so glorious when we give our best. These three magi challenge us to bring our best. And if it looks a little dangerous, don't worry. It was dangerous for the magi. But remember who showed up in a dream to them and said, don't go back to Herod. I want you going a different way home. So when you decide where you're at in stewardship season of what you want to offer to God, it might be a little scary. <laughs> but that's okay. God's going to guide you home, and he's got that star, the light of Christ, guiding you the whole way. Happy Epiphany, and let's bring our best. Amen.